these guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. Okay, we got Kyle Tige in the house. We got our guy Jim Pete. And I was just telling our friends Judd and Declan about a half hour ago. Uh, we were at Red Cow doing some stuff for Purple Daily. And uh, our friend Jeremy, our uh, our great server at Red Cow, was like, what do you think of this Wolf Sun series? And I said, I'm about to tape a podcast with Jim Peterson in like 30 minutes. And before I panic, I want to hear if there's panic in Jim's voice with this matchup. So as, as Jim decides how much we should panic that's how much i am going to panic so jim pete wolves and sons your thoughts i mean i think that obviously it's not a great matchup for us um I, you know when you rather play the world champions um in some ways because i think we match up better with denver than we do with phoenix i think that um and this is like one of my mantras since finchie has been here is is has been in finch we trust and so I think that Finchie didn't show all of his cards in game 82. Um, he didn't show all his cards and what he's willing to do matchup wise, scheme wise. And um, I was at practice today um, and I really like some of the adjustments that they're planning. Oh, look at that tease. So, I emoji. Is KG, KG's uh, back, isn't he? KG. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean like seriously, like, no, but it's like, this is what I'm saying. Like Finchie, like he's just a, I think this coaching staff too, I think they, they have hearty debates and I think that um, he's willing to, cause all he really cares about is winning the series. And I think he's willing to do things matchup wise. That'll make it better for Minnesota to match up better. And I think he's also willing to adjust to things. And I think some of the offensive adjustments that he's made to the heavy gap pressure defense that Phoenix such, the, the shell concept, you know, like when you when you start practice at the beginning of training camp and you really should do shell shell defense. It's just shell drill, right? Mm -hmm. It's a four man shell. You can do a five man shell if you want to. But what what Phoenix is doing to Ant is they're just basically playing the shell and they're like they're, there's gap help on either side of whoever the primary defender is. They're literally bringing three and four guys to Ant's side of the floor. Mm -hmm. And so how do you counteract that? Well, Finchie's got a couple wrinkles up his sleeves. Uh, so. <laughs> well, okay. So I'm just not to Phil, I told you this earlier, but I think Suns fans now they're trying to consume as much content have started to listen to our stuff. Cause we were getting raked over the coals earlier this week about the whole, well, if things don't work out, maybe Kevin Durant comes to Minnesota and stuff. Blah, blah, oh, blah. people pick like when we're, we were doing that we're whole like thing. Getting is that on like Suns Reddit right now? Yeah. And that's like, why would you aggregate me of all people? But uh, Jim, without <laughs> telling all Finchie's secrets, this team, from my perspective, like did what they did this year because they embraced their size and they played big. Uh, you've coached before. You've played before. You are big. Like, is that something that you would still try to lean into? Because that's kind of been your bread and butter with, you know, having a big front line and even playing Nas like at the three sometimes. Well, I mean, this, you've got versatility on your roster. So, you know, there are some things you can, you can, you know, die on in terms of the, the hill you want to die on in terms mm -hmm. of like going at some of the advantages you have. Yeah, size has been an advantage for Minnesota, no doubt. But also you have you know, roster versatility where yeah. you can change up and, and match up with them too. So there's no shame in that. I mean, it's not just because you're changing lit and Vinci's played all different kinds of rosters. They played small before. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think they can do that. And, and, you know, it's really whatever it takes to win the game. You know what I mean? Like, and I just think that what I've just come down on is that Finchie's willing to do whatever it takes to win and, and whatever that entails. Yeah. So my favorite stat that uh, I think I can't remember, I think it was Jake painting through this out, but, and it's a small sample size, but when Nikhil Alexander Walker is guarding Devin Booker this season, Booker is 0 for 9. I guess my question off that is, I don't know which, if that's true, but I, th I think there's a not by NBA.com, not, not by NBA, because I track all, you know, because that's one of the advanced things. It's tracking's kind of uh is kind of hard sometimes, you know, because mm -hmm. like who's really guarding them. You know what I mean? Like if you get switched on, who was the primary? I don't know. It's uh, but no, I what you're saying, I I get though, and I I really think Nikhil is is one of those versatility guys that you know can also guard any one of them, any one of those players. Like I think he can guard Beal, 
although Bradley Beal did big boy him one time um, in that game. But against Booker, I think he does a great job. And I think that was yeah, – I did see that that same breakdown you're talking about. And I did kind of look at that stat, and I went and looked it up, and I don't know that that's altogether true. Yeah. So, so And Jake's a homie, uh, howls and growls. But I saw that too. Also, I saw someone else from the Suns angle that said, according to NBA.com's matchup data, Booker was shooting one for 17 – when guarded by Nikhil in the last two seasons. So I think there's some noise in there, but I think, Phil, the original point, Nikhil's a dog. He's kind of the forgotten defensive yep. stud on this team, right behind Rudy, behind Jaden, even behind Ant at times. Uh, I just imagine he's going to factor into this this series a lot more than he has, and he's been really, really good this season, but he's going to have a big role in the playoffs. Yeah, that, that's kind of, like I guess my question off that is, is there a player, is it Nikhil, Jim Pete, that you would say, yep, more more of this ingredient. Mm. This is the this is people spend so much time, <clears throat> you know, speculating on is it less of Carl or is it less of something else? Who is it more of for you? Like who would you start and say, yeah, we need we need like five or ten more minutes of of this guy because we think he can help. Yeah, I think I think Nikhil, Nikhil is is one of those guys you could add to the ingredient list and and say we'd like to see more of. Because you're going to see more of them by definition because coaches shorten their benches. Yep. They're, they're only going to yeah. play seven, eight guys, you know, and, and maybe it's eight and a half, you know. But, uh, yeah, Nikhil's going to see more duty just because they need more of him in this series. If it's Denver, maybe not. But if in this particular series, I think Nikhil, by necessity, needs to play more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you, back to that gap help thing, because that's kind of what Dane and I were talking about immediately after game 82, but – um, you're kind of a connoisseur of the league as well. I know you watch other teams and you're plugged in with all. The... Can you just talk about I, I, my one of my biggest concerns is Frank Vogel is a really good coach, and he did a really good job kind of designing a defensive scheme in the bubble year when the Lakers won. And I think he's done a really good job of getting guys that you wouldn't necessarily think are like defensive stars in like a Bradley Beal and a Nurkic and stuff. Like just in general, what are your thoughts on Vogel and the job he's done this year in his first year and what are some things you could do again without showing Finchie's hand that you could do to kind of break up that, that gap help and get Ant. Cause that one of the things is Jim, I'm sure you've seen this stat. This one's real 43 points for Ant on 42 shots this season against the Suns. That's not going to cut it. Yeah. I mean, you know, getting the ball out of Ant's hands a little bit more and let, letting him play on the second side more. Yeah. I think that um, there are ways to get Ant, the, even if he brings the ball up the floor quickly to have him get off of it and then get it, get it back again, like in, in other situations, like having him move. Uh, the, they need player movement and ball movement. That's mm-hmm. that's the thing. And, and it was obvious in that game. And so when you go back and watch the video, and, you know, we'll break down some of that stuff uh, when we, when we you know, play on Saturday. But, um, no, they, they've, they've got counters to it. And they've been sa- – you're saving some of that stuff, yeah. right? It's like when you – you always do that during the regular season. You don't show teams you might see in the playoffs all that you have in terms of adjusting within the season. So, um, no, I, I really, I really like Vogel. Like he, he did a great job in the bu- bubble with the Lakers. Um, he's, I think he's a better defensive coach than he is offensive coach. But he, he's kind of an old school coach too. He, there's a lot of old school sensibilities that he has with within his coaching philosophy, but. Um, I think that more than anything else, what he's proven that he can do is he can coach big personalities. He did yeah. that in Los Angeles. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's a lot harder. It, it being able to manage these big personalities is not as easy as it seems, and it, it's 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 it can break a lot of coaches. And I think with Frank Vogel, he's able to get concepts through to them, and they're able to to buy in. So one of, one of the great things is we were talking about this: like, why is this matchup so different than it is than playing the Clippers? you know, because the Clippers have all these offensive weapons all over the floor too, right? But they play so much ISO basketball, they're a little bit easier to defend. This Phoenix team is so ball movement, heavy move, heavy ball and player movement. Booker is so good. The other thing too is that Durant is is just fine not having to dominate the ball. He doesn't mm-hmm. want to have to do everything for Phoenix. So if, if Beal is cooking or Booker's cooking, he's fine scoring 15 points in a game. He's not going to be upset with that. So – um, I think Vogel's done a great job managing these people and biding his time because this has been a monster in waiting. And they've been now coming along for the past month 
or so. It's like it's like Dallas, you know. Mm-hmm. Dallas has really got started cooking here over the past, you know, six weeks or so. And so Phoenix is in that same vein. I mean, can you guys like the Western Conference matchups are wild here? We're gonna I mean, obviously we're gonna get like Oklahoma City versus whoever wins the the Friday night playing, but you get that Lakers team and that Nuggets team. So we get a Western Conference Finals rematch in the first round. And then the Mavericks Clippers that you're referencing. And then the Timberwolves Suns. This is, and the Warriors are out already. It's just, I mean, this is one of the most wild Western Conference playoff brackets that we've seen in years, Jim Pete. We're probably going to get Sacramento in there too, right? Because, you know, Zion's Zion's out. Zion's not going to play. So, and Sacramento just dismantled Golden State. So, we're probably going to have, you know, Sacramento be that eight seed. So, I don't know. There's it's it's going to be super fascinating, man. I can't I can't wait for all this to start and to watch all these games. Uh, this week's edition of you played. I didn't. The biggest question I have game one Saturday, 2 30 p.m. tip at Target Center. What was what was a matinee game like for Jim Pete back in the day? And does that mess up your sleep schedule? Like, how do you prepare for a game that's, you know, you, you kind of have a clock, right? That you're like, I'm used to playing at nighttime. Like, is that stuff matter? Or do you kind of just start planning for that days ahead? I loved it. Really? Okay. I, I loved I loved afternoon games because you practice in the morning. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You practice in the morning and then it's a it's a let's get it on kind of day. You know, like let's let's because you don't have to go to shoot around. Cause to me, a lot of a lot of the stuff in professional sports is all the downtime that there mm-hmm. is. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like going to, sh- you have to get up and go to shoot around and then you have to go back home and take a nap. And then you got to come back to the game and get ready. And then, you know, you got to get up and do it all over again. So, um, no, I, I did not mind afternoon games. I flourished in afternoon games. Cause then you got the rest of the night to yourself. You know what I mean? Like you actually get a, <laughs> you get a night Good where point. you can actually relax. I mean, that's, it's really nice. No, I, I don't know why some guys have a problem with it because it's your natural rhythm. Because really, you know, you, you practice and spend time at shooter and stuff way more than you do um, than you do playing games. So it's it's kind of a natural. I always really enjoyed it. Reminds me of the, the famous Sam Cassell quote, I think, from 20 years ago that spree spree just don't like playing in the daytime. Spree <laughs> just don't like playing in the daytime. <laughs> I don't remember if that's an actual stat that Latrell Sprewell did not like playing in the daytime. But some guys, to your point, Dan Gladden, baseball player. Hated playing in the daytime back in the 80s and 90s. I think it's going to be just a good, I mean, I would imagine there's going to be a lot of brunches on Saturday morning around the city with fans. And yeah. uh, I also think, too, as we do a playoff preview, I wanted to, there's like a couple of things I had down. And Jim, you've been at all these home games, but this, I think the Wolves were one of the only nine teams this year to sell out all 41 home games. Not really a question here, just I'm really excited to be there on Saturday, and I'm sure you are too, that that place is going to be rocking. And I hope people have had a mimosa or two or six and, uh, I know some people have kind of lost a little trust in this team because, again, the Suns had their number all regular season. But playoff basketball, as we've already learned in the plan, is so different. So I don't know. I couldn't. I'm excited, Jim, to watch a battle against Kevin Durant. Like that's one of the guys I've watched growing up. So it's going to be the purest of basketball, and I'm excited to see Vogel and see Finch make adjustments game in and game out because it really is like you know a boxing match with rounds. So it's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. Well, I I think that you know. And I just was talking to Nas about this because mm. um, just, you know, chatting with Nas Reed post-practice. Um, the the article that Chris Hine did about Nas, if you haven't seen it, you should read it. Um, if you have to, because you don't subscribe to the Star Tribune, have a friend, you know, make a PDF of it or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, basically, I'm, Nas and I were talking about how fast the season went. And the season just blew by. It seems like, you know, last week they were in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and so, um, you know, and Rebecca Brunson was sitting there um, and Michael Grady was sitting there too as, as I was chatting with Nas. So they kind of jumped in. But one of the things um, I, I told the Lynx players, and this is a story that Lindsay Whalen even talked about in her in her Hall of Fame induction speech is that um, when you're a player or a coach um, in in professional sports, you you have a tendency of wishing time away, and like you just say, God, if we can just get through this month and get to this part of the schedule, or just get through this difficult time, or 
this part of the injury that I would just wish would go away. You end up wishing time away and all of a sudden your career is over. Yeah. And so one thing when I was coaching with the Lynx, um, I was just telling our players to not wish time away. And so I was talking to Nas about that. Like he was saying how fast the season went. I'm like, yeah, I said, it's really important that you don't wish time away. And so I, I would say the same thing for fans. Don't just forget about the regular season and the season that this team just had. Let's not, you know, I don't, and it's almost like the Vikings season, Phil. I don't know if you can resonate with this, but the season the Vikings had a couple of years ago when they beat everybody, they had all those, those heart attack comeback wins and they seemingly couldn't lose the, mm-hmm. the win at Buffalo. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like that, that winning that game, like I told myself when that Viking season was over that I don't care what happens in the playoffs. They, as a fan, they made me happy with that regular season with all those games that they fought and won. Like it almost was enough for me. And I'm not saying that this season is, is like that with the Timberwolves. Cause obviously, you know, legacies are at stake and we want to win a, a playoff series for crying out loud. You should win more than one in 20 years. I mean, yeah. No. Yeah. And our fan base deserves it, but I'm just saying, don't wish time away. Don't wish seasons away. I just wish this season could keep on going on. Cause it's been so much fun, but I can't wait for Saturday. I just, I mean, Grady and I were talking about that. Like, we just can't wait. And I just think that I think the, the players are in the same mindset. It was a really spirited practice yesterday. It was a spirited practice today. They are flying around. And um, I think the biggest key for them, and this is what Chris Finch said post practice, is to match the physicality from yep. the very beginning of the game. It's one of the mm-hmm. biggest keys to this game. Yeah. Well, a little, little housekeeping, and then Phil, I'll throw it back to you. But Jim, I've seen you get enough questions you and Grady and Bally Sports will be covering, you know, broadcasting all of the games for the round one. So yeah. I've seen a lot yeah. of people being like, if it's on national TV, can we still watch Grady and Jim? The answer is yes. Yes. Just like you've been doing all regular seasons. So we got to clear that up. Jim and Grady will be calling all four of these games while the Wolves sweep this. Unless season. it's on ABC. If it's ABC, that's oh, okay. But that's the okay. only one. But I don't, I don't see us being on the – game seven, though. And here's another – I forgot to ask – um our people about this today game seven my wife clued me in on this one if there's a game seven there's a Lynx game that night mm. really? well <laughs> game, game, game seven would be on tnt according to the schedule that free sent out but uh yeah five and six are tbd but there's no abc on the schedule so you'll get plenty of jim and grady but yeah if we a Lynx and a wolves like double header at home well, yeah would they play one awesome. early and then one late and clear the, the arena the wolves wolves early Lynx late Wow. Oh, that's so that's official. That's what it would be. I from no Tika Pete's the source. So <laughs> a great source. That's, that's a, lovely a, source. Yeah, she's a great source. source. She's yeah, she's <laughs> right a lot. But so I did not confirm with Aaron Freeman today. I should have done that. I meant to do I I did preface this whole comment with saying that. I should have <laughs> Yes, this is not this is not official. Do not aggregate this. If there are <laughs> if there are angry Suns fans out there, don't <laughs> Don't we'll aggregate this. Right. <laughs> um, you know, uh, just switching gears here, D- Dane Moore was tweeting out some just quotes from the locker room yesterday, and he talked to Carl Anthony Towns. And, and and the question was asked to Carl, how important is this series for you individually? And just for some background, I think most Wolves are familiar with, you know, his his playoff performances. You've seen some gems. You, that you know, the, Was it the playing game against the Lakers? He kind of carried the team for the first half, and there's been some gems. But in about half of the play, the last 14 playoff games, he's in foul trouble. In about a third of the games, he's shooting 30% or less. Like, he's just uh, – he has struggled in a lot of playoff games. It's obvious to anyone who's watched it. And Carl was pretty reflective when answering this question, and he said – it's really, really, really important, this series. Like, probably one of the most important things in my career so far here in Minnesota. Have a great chance to do something. There's a lot on the line. We got a lot to play for. How would, like, just from a Carl standpoint and and looking at his whole career to this point, how big do you think this playoff stretch is for Carl? Well, I I, I think it's it's really important for his legacy Um, it's, it's important for Ant to build a legacy. It's important for, for Chris Finch to establish a legacy of winning as a coach. He's done it here. And I, you know, I just, I think that Finch, he's got a lot on the line, but for Carl, 
he's trying to buck a narrative that is pretty ingrained. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, that, that, you know, a lot of people can put up big numbers and, you know, we know that Kevin Love put up big numbers here as a Minnesota Timberwolf player, but it didn't lead to any, any team success. Uh, Carl Anthony Towns is, has been so loyal to this team and he's, he has had a lot more play ethics success than a lot of people since Kevin Garnett left. Um, but he's not been the driver of winning in a playoff series. So some of it wasn't his fault initially with when Tibbs was here in that series against Houston, because we had Jimmy Butler and Tibbs didn't, didn't really focus on Carl. So that really wasn't Carl's fault, but the last two, he's had a he's had an opportunity to do big things, and and Minnesota really should beat in Memphis. I mean, that was that was the one playoff series I really feel like like Carl could have impacted in a in a bigger way. Yeah. Um, but no, I think this is really important. And you know what? Um, in my mind, you know, I think that this is one of those series where it's going to be difficult for Minnesota to play big all the time. So if if you know it's going to be important for Carl to be if if you have to like go small that he's not going to get t twisted up, you know, be, and he wants to, you know, he's been saying he's willing to do whatever it takes. And so it may be sitting on the bench, supporting your teammates for stretches of the game. You know, that might, might be the case. So I'm not saying that's the case. I'm saying it could be the case it could be mm -hmm. part of the adjustment process. So we're going to find out a lot about a lot of people through this series. Rudy is also sort of fighting a narrative, right? I mean, he's fighting the, you can't play in the playoffs with Rudy Gobert because he gets played off the court because we saw it against the Clippers and the Mavericks. And of course, the irony of it is like they literally drew the one opponent that you might have to go small against. Um, and we've talked a lot on this podcast about it's not as much Rudy and his fault with the Jazz. It was the perimeter defenders were not very good in Utah and people sort of got it twisted. So that's another one where we'll we'll see how I I, I hope the Wolves win this series so that Cat can stick it to some people, me included, over the years. And <laughs> and so Rudy can stick it to some people that I think were wrong about the Clippers and the Mavs series for uh, those jazz runs. Well, did you guys see the soundbite that DeMarcus Cousins had? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you also see that DeMarcus Cousins' last, I think, NBA play was getting shut down by Rudy Gobert at the Was ring. it? <laughs> so a little irony there. But uh, Well, I, I mean, like the whole thing is like – for I mean, DeMarcus Cousins can be on a platform like that and talk about Rudy Gobert disparagingly in that situation. He's the expert, so he kind of gets away with it. But he clearly hasn't been watching games. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because if, if you're saying that, that Rudy Gobert, you know, how can he be defensive player of the year if he gets played off the court and can't finish games? I'm like, have you not, you've not clearly watched him all season long in a Timberwolves uniform because that's not been the case at all. I think a, a cool thing you mentioned, like the best word you've said all day was just legacy. And I think the Carl conversation is really interesting. I think the Rudy one is interesting. Jim, you were at practice today, so this might be like kind of a review or repeat for you. But Phil, did you see what Mike Conley said after no. practice? Mm -hmm. He had this cool quote about uh, his urgency as the playoffs begin. You know, Mike's kind of the oldest guy on the team, and uh, he was telling media, my urgency is an all-time high. I don't think there's anybody on either team that wants it more than me. I told the guys that selfishly, do it for me, man. Help me out. Meet me at my level right now because I don't got long. Y'all got forever, it feels like. But I reminded them that the last time I made it deep, deep in the playoffs was like 12 years ago. So it's not a given. You got to be taking advantage of the moments you get. This is a heck of a team we have here and a heck of an opportunity that we don't want to waste. That kind of just ties into what Jim said, right? Like, don't don't look forward too much. Don't look back too much. Kind of embrace the moment. But uh. For Mike being a cool cucumber, and Jim, you're around him all the time, for him to kind of come out and be like, you know, do it for me, and he's like the least selfish person in the world, I think that just tells you how probably locked in some of these guys are and how they will embrace the moment starting on Saturday. I love that, Kyle. I love that you uh, brought that up and that Mike said it, and it kind of dovetails in what I've said about this whole thing is that you know, my second year in the NBA, we went to the NBA finals and, and mm -hmm. I feel like we felt like we were going to get there every year after that. And we never even sniffed another NBA finals during my tenure with the Rockets. And then everybody was traded and then it's all over, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. you only get so many bites at the apple and Mike knows that this is a special team. And so I love that he put it in those terms because that's how players play for each other right there. Yep. And those guys love Mike. 
you know? And so I just, I just love that he put it in those terms. And, you know, um, I, I, I don't know. I forget if it was Dane's podcast I was listening to and I don't, Kyler might've been with you. Okay. Was Dane saying that it's too early to talk about legacy? Like, were, did you guys have this conversation about legacy? Oh, oh man, I, we do a lot of podcasts, Jim. I say a lot of dumb stuff. So I, <laughs> Whoa. So, uh, but no, I mean, I, I go keep going. So, what do you? No, but so anyway, so I said to say, look, one of the things that Cheryl Reeve, I just go back to my Lynx experience too, because Taj McWilliams, Franklin, Simone Augustus, and Maya Moore are all going into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame um, this this uh, month, and. Um, one of the things that Cheryl, when she first took the job over and she was talking to Simone and Simone always brings this up. And I just brought it up with Simone when I was texting with her is that Cheryl challenged her because Simone was a perennial all-star, but a loser links yeah. lost all the time. Mm -hmm. And Cheryl challenged her and said, what do you want your legacy to be? You know? And so she did this before we had any success with the links. She was challenging Simone about her legacy. And so I don't think it's too early to talk about legacy because that's how you build a resume. Yeah. That's how you get to the hall of fame. That's why making an all-star team, you know, um, I was arguing with Michael Thompson about Michael Cooper, making it into the hall of fame. And I was like, Michael, I mean, like, like, cause Michael's pro Michael Cooper. Right. And <laughs> tell me you guys aren't shocked. Michael Cooper made it to the hall of fame. Yeah. You it's a, yeah, a little shocking. A little yeah. shocked. And so I'm, I'm just saying like, look at his resume. I said, Michael, he never made an all-star game. And Michael's like, oh, it's just a popularity contest. And I and so I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, no, it's it's part, you know, he never made an all NBA team. He made an all defensive team, and that's fine, but he never made an all NBA team. So, like when you at, at the end of your career and they look back and they look at your legacy, how many playoff wins do you have? Yeah, it's, correct. It's because it's the playoffs, it's the titles, it's hit it Michael matters. Cooper's. Yeah. It ma this matters. This is and so that's why that's why I say a lot of people's legacies are at stake. Um, and that's putting mine as a broadcaster because no, you're minted. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Like I tell you what, I just I you know I was gonna say like I just I was so much of a homer that that first that last game at game eighty two. I was I was getting a little heated. I was getting a little homerish <laughs> in the game. You, you, you got to tone it down a little. Is that I got to yeah, I got to tone it down, man. I was getting too I was getting too hyped. It was. Um, <laughs> I just want my team to win too much. And I just, you know, I care about these people. So legacy, man, it, it matters. It all matters. But I, Jim, I think that's why I'm like amped about this series is like the hill is steeper to push this rock up. But on the legacy conversation, if these guys win this first round series, I mean, the goal is to win a title and play this thing into June. But man, if they can, I mean, they're literally underdogs now, according to all sports books and stuff to win this series. If they can pull this off and, and beat Kevin Durant and beat Devin Booker, um, Phil, I know you'll get this, but like from Rounders, that movie about poker, when Dude, they say at the end, my, like, that's my favorite movie of all time, by the way. That's my favorite movie of all time, movie. too. But uh, yeah. when he says at the end, he's like, you can't lose what you don't put in, mm -hmm. but you can't win much either. Like, I don't care about the past. I don't care about Joe Smith or David Kahn or all that stuff or Steph Curry. Like, live in the moment, show up on Saturday, be ready to go, uh, tune in to listen to Jim and Grady do it. But if they can pull this off, man, legacies are going to be defined and reimagined. And uh, I'm excited. Fearless. Why haven't we gotten a Phil, rounder Phil. sequel, by the way? Oh, I, yeah. we, we need one. We, we get sequels to like The Lion King. Like, we got to have a sequel to the best movie ever made. <laughs> hey, that man is money. <laughs> hey, that, let's pay him. Rounders pay that him. man his money. <laughs> he check, check, check all night. He check. I'm glad they oh. both love that movie. It is literally like the best movie. So, that was Phil. I'm going to be doing that for the next 48 hours as I kind of ramp people up. And we have our live show tomorrow. So, I'll be face painted doing the Braveheart thing. But really, bring it on. Bring it on. I mean, I. The Wolves didn't show anything against the Suns all, all regular season. But when the Wolves did good stuff, Phil, you you know this, it was always like, do it in the playoffs, do it in the playoffs. So the Suns had their number, but it's like, do it in the playoffs. So be yeah. fearless, live in the moment, embrace the moment, and try to build your legacy like Jim said. I think that's the biggest takeaway from, again, someone who's seen it all and been there and done it all. So, And maybe you'll get in the Hall of Fame one day. No, that's not happening. Are you, are you in the Minnesota Broadcasters Hall of Fame yet? I'm I'm in one Hall of Fame. I'm in the St. Louis Park Hall of Fame. Okay, okay. That's deserved. And proud to be there. Okay, and that's St. Louis Park High School. It's not Benilde, right? It's not Benilde. No. Okay, Judd Zolgad went to Benilde. We're trying to get him some love for the Hall of Fame there. <laughs> 
he just bullied people at recess so with his sports takes <laughs> so jim before we say goodbye oh any God, final man. any final words of wisdom before this series begins and we'll, obviously we'll, we'll we'll catch up between travels next week but any other final thoughts from you here on flagger and house no, I just I think um, you know one thing I I was just talking to Grady about as we're watching practice. I was like, there's opportunities for Mike Connolly to attack. Hmm. I think Mike's going to be a big part of it. Nas is I think going to have a really good series. Um, I think that um, I, I just am really I think a lot of it balances on how effective Cat's going to be in this series. I think Cat's going to be a big part of whether or not they win this series or not. I just. I think Ant's going to be fine. Ant, um, I think they're going to make adjustments. Ant's going to be fine. But I'm just really pulling for Carl Anthony Towns. That's my main thing is I really want Cat to have a great series. I'm really yeah. pulling for him. So all the positive vibes we can send Cat's way would be beneficial. Come on, Cat. You got this, Cat. Go, baby. He doesn't Go. want to hear I mean, She doesn't want to hear from me. I've been pretty critical over the years. But Cat, listen. Yeah. Hey, if you need to put a picture of the, your critics on the mirror, like Rocky <laughs> Four, and crumple them every day, happy to send a few over. Put Charles Barkley up there. Put Shaq up there. So, Jim Pete, we love having you on the Thank podcast. You, Thanks, Happy guys. Saturday. Always fun. We'll talk to you again Thank soon you. here. Okay. Thank you. All right. There he goes. Jim Peterson, the legend. Let's get our guy, producer extraordinaire, Ross Brendel in. Yes. Studio audience. Keep, yeah. keep, keep going. Applause keep coming going. For Roscoe. How you so, boys doing? Uh, that was, man, sometimes you just need a little Jim Pete in your life, you know? I know that. I've told we, you before, I don't like following him. Sorry to cut you off, Kyle, but, I mean, I look bad as it is, and then when you have to follow Jim Pete, it's even worse. And I, I mean, listen, no one gets more deserved criticism than me, because I still don't know what I'm doing, but uh, it, I, it's just cool to talk to that man, because between the stories he has and just kind of, I really do think he has a really unique perspective, right? Because he's played in the NBA, but he's also coached at a really high level and he's, mm -hmm. you know, kind of seen it all. So, I mean, he, that's about as much of an eye emoji when he was like, Finch has got some things up his sleeve. So now I'm even, it was, and he can't share that, but... too much because he's yeah. got a little more access than would be allowed yep. to, to speak at this point. But real, what, before we get to the random wolf on the cat front, you know, it's man, this is such a unique point in his career because if he struggles again and they get beat, like he could literally get traded in a couple mm -hmm. months and he could be, now he could just be a guy that stuffs stats on a bad team and his career is taking a left turn over here. But if he is a key reason for why they knock off the Suns and now they go, I mean, it's like, this is a crazy fork in the road for his career in particular. And it feels like he kind of feels and understands the gravity of it too, just based on his yeah. comments to the media yesterday. Wouldn't you... And not to turn this into a Hallmark card, but Ross, you got to comment on this too. Wouldn't you rather be in control of that though? Because this oh, is a yes. fork in the road moment. And like, if they go down in five or God forbid gets swept, like that's probably it. And there'll be the video of him walking off and like, is this the last time Carl Anthony Towns will don a Timberwolves jersey? But if he can just, again, I think the names that he would be beating, right? Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, Kevin Durant. If these guys can get a serious playoff win under their belt, and I really think if they beat the Suns, they're going to be the media favorite, like, or just the fan favorite in terms of all these, you know, Charles Barkley's of the world being like, they just beat my sons. Like they, they can beat the nuggets. So this is a pretty big, as I said on Tuesday, final boss that if they can get through this one, erase 20 years again, uh, as a famous poet once said, uh, decades of futility, if they can wipe all that away. It's going to be, they're going to be a dangerous well, team going into May. So. And real quick to your, to that point about like the magnitude of this series, Patrick Royce, pointed this out on Royce Unchained this morning. People forget this because it was the beginning of the season. When the preseason NBA championship odds came out, the Celtics and the Nuggets were tied at four and a half to one, mm -hmm. most likely to win the championship. The next most likely team to win the championship preseason was the Phoenix Suns. Yep. Now they had to take a dip and they had, they had injuries and they're trying to gel Bradley Beal and, you know, just it was putting a bunch of pieces together, but they've kind of come together. You know, they, 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 they got themselves out of the plan into the six seed. Obviously they've challenged the Timberwolves, but is this version of the, now they also got smoked by the Clippers backups a couple weeks ago. So I'm not saying they're like a honed championship product by any means, but it wasn't that long ago that the Phoenix suns were one of the three most likely teams, according to odds makers to win the championship. 
and you're staring at that team in the first round. It would be a massive, massive first round win. This wouldn't be like playing, you know, rookie Carmelo Anthony 20 years ago in the first round against the Nuggets and like Francisco Elson and KG are going at it. Like this is a real opponent in the first round and it would elevate Cat's legacy if they could knock him off. If you are to win this series, and we talked about this, I think, a few days ago, to Kyle's point, I think it makes you the fan favorite to come out of the West. I think a lot of analysts would then say it makes the Timberwolves the favorite to come out of the West. And I think Cat and Rudy, I think you welcome that. And you know you're going to see a team like the Suns at some point. Heck, depending on how seeding worked, you could have seen them in the second or third round anyway. So again, why not take on quote unquote Goliath right away? Mm. Take them down and see what it does for your confidence. Uh, louder. Again, I louder. I don't for the people in the back. <laughs> I don't have gas me up. Let's go. Thank you. Keep going I don't off. have keep going. I don't have much of a problem with this first round matchup. I get it. There's a lot of fans puckering. There's a lot of fans terrified. Well, newsflash: you're not just going to be handed the NBA championship yeah. or the Western Conference championship. You are going to have to beat good teams. And yes, just because the Timberwolves have had success against other teams that they've played in the playoffs, doesn't mean you would see that exact same form of those teams in the playoffs either. Let's let this play out and have some fun with it. But yes, Phil, to your point for Cat, think about what Cat and the Timberwolves and the Minnesota Vikings are up in the next couple of weeks, what faces them. Both franchises in downtown Minneapolis are really kind of at this crossroads point where they can go one of two ways. The Timberwolves can win a first-round playoff series, win a playoff series for the first time in 20 years. People talk about, oh, they've won two playoff series. Yes, in the same season. Yes, they only won a playoff series in one season. Mm -hmm. So it's big for them, and I know it's not Purple Daily, but the Vikings going through the same stretch here over the next week or two, a lot of big stuff for them too. So it is a fun time to be a Minnesota sports fan. But embrace it. It doesn't always, I get it. It's Minnesota, it's doom and gloom. I understand that. But guess what? It doesn't always have to be that way. It turned for the Cubs, it turned for the Red Sox. Maybe it'll turn for the Minnesota Timberwolves. If you know how the story story ends, why would you read the book, right? Yes, 100%. So confirmed that past Minnesota sports tragedies are how this one's going to end, I totally get it. Put the book down. It's going to be nice this weekend. Go golf. But, uh, I, I love being hurt, so I've done it too many times, and I'm ready for it again, and I'm raw, and I'm exposed, and Saturday should be one of the coolest environments this this organization, this franchise has ever had. This is going to be better than those Grizzlies series, the Nuggets series. This team has home court. They have a real shot, and you know it's kind of bleeper get off the pot for a lot of these guys, and uh, I'll be sitting there with them come Saturday and Phil, afternoon. write this down. The Suns. <laughs> will not win this series in four or five games. If the Suns do somehow win this series, it's going to take them at least six or seven games to do it. This, this crazy talk of not winning a game is ridiculous. The twins, the twins, excuse me, the Timberwolves will not be swept in this. This is where where getting, I know that you'd like the one or the two seed, but at least you have the three seed for, again, this is the second time in franchise history. They've had a top three seed. So that if it gets to a game seven, at least you get 18,000 screaming fans at Target mm-hmm. Center if you can get out of the far. So, all right, boys, let's do a random wolf of the week sure. here, led by Ross. Kyle on a four random wolf win streak with Jared Bayless, Nas Reed, Stefan Marbury, and Dante Cunningham. Kyle has 13 wins to my six. Ross will throw out some clues here, and we get up to three incorrect guesses each, not counting our heat check guess after the first clue. If one of us hits the third and final strike, the other one wins automatically. No Googling. Here we go. No Google. Use your noodle, as they like to say, boys. Wow. Okay, here we go. Clue number one. If Ross had to guess who's going to win this round of Random Wolf of the Week, he would guess Phil. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Heat check time, boys. Heat check. (laughs) Is it Will Avery? (laughs) <laughs> it is not with Oh, Avery. man. Oh, Wouldn't that have been something if that's what I did to you? <laughs> Kyle, what do you got? I, I just got that he's probably a little little older or a little more obscure, and there's no good draft data for me to parse through. So uh, I'm pushing the rock uphill. Give me a are player. You, are you going to do give a heat check, guess? You get a heat check. Oh, I mean, uh, Lou Amundsen. 
Oh, that's a good one. Not correct. Okay. All right. This random wolf of the week played for five NBA franchises. Five NBA franchises. My hunch is Phil will win today's round. It's, now you're putting Easy. pressure on. I'm putting pressure on him. This random wolf of the week was born a stone's throw away from the National Football League Hall of Fame. This random wolf of the week born a stone's throw away from the National Football League Hall of Fame. Hmm. Aspen, huh? <laughs> I thought it was Vale. This random wolf of the week played in just 39 games for the Minnesota Timberwolves. See, these like passer throughs, they're always. Oh, it's flyover country for Timberwolves. These knowledge. passer throughs. This random wolf of the week, however, did play in almost 700 career NBA games. So, 700 ish career NBA games. Roughly 40-ish, 39 to be exact, with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Hmm. All right, Kyle, I'm not giving you a year here, but I can tell you this random wolf of the week was a first-round draft pick in the NBA draft. Got the 30, this, 39 games with the Wolves. God. This random wolf of the week last played professionally in the 2022-2023 season for the dreaded, the feared London Lions. <laughs> okay, now we're getting closer to the Shanghai Sharks, my favorite team. Okay. The London Lions. Great name, by the way. I might need, might need some jerseys. Might need a hat. This yeah. random wolf of the week was a McDonald's All-American in... 2007. Okay. Okay. So, oh boy. Yeah, now you're doing math. I love it. <laughs> I was okay, told there so would be no like math. A... Oh my gosh, dude. This random wolf of the week was the MVP of the 2008 National Invitational Tournament little thing we like to call the uh, go for basketball invitational the NIT tournament okay so he would have been oh no he's figuring it out (laughs) this random wolf of the week played the majority of his NBA career for the Sacramento Kings holy cow I might have to dig up more uh More clues on the fly here. This random wolf of the week, boys. This is the one that never helps Kyle, which is why I include it, because it's hilarious. This random wolf of the week averaged just 2.7 points per game and 2.5 rebounds per game for the Timberwolves. Oh, man. Cole Aldridge? Is that a guess? Yeah. Kyle! Not correct. (laughs) Phil. (laughs) Phil. I love played. that you're just. I love that you're just ready for the buzzer. How many Did guesses? Wait? So wait. So I have. Kyle has one I'm incorrect. You're, right. Yeah, you're clear. Yeah. I'm clear. Oh, it may. Okay. It may start to turn here. This random wolf of the week is seven feet tall, weighing 245 pounds. This is me scrambling to get my laptop in case I need more clues. And he played 39 games. First round pick. This random wolf. Brad of the Miller. Week is... oh. No, it's not Brad Miller. I'll buzz. That me. is not correct. It's not Brad Miller. <laughs> well done. That's a good guess, though. That's a good guess. He was early two thousands. And he was here for more than thirty nine games, right? Was he? Can I look up Brad Miller real quick? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Go right. Yeah, quick, go quick right ahead. It gives me a chance to scramble if I need more clues. Just looking up Brad Miller. Okay, Brad Miller. Now yeah, he was born in the. He's 6'11", 244, so pretty much 7 feet, 245. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good guess. Played the majority of his career with the Sacramento Kings. Played 15 games with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Where he averaged 2.3 points per game. Oh, you said 2.7. Wow, I see. Yeah, 2.7 point, uh, so points per game. Pretty much Brad Miller is what you're saying. Basically, yeah. 
This random wolf of the week is one of five Timberwolves all time to play college basketball for the Ohio State University. No more clues. Um, Wait. Oh, no. He's not seven no. feet, though. I was going to say. I know who you're going to say. This random wolf of the week is one of five Timberwolves all time to play college basketball for the Ohio State University. Oh, I guess I can no longer give clues unless Kyle tells me I can. You know, you're so. fu- people are but you said, wait, you said seven feet, right? Seven feet? Seven feet yep. tall, played for the Kings. 245 I have, I ha- pounds. I have to say this out loud, but it's Evan Turner. But it's he's not seven feet. Evan Turner. And that's a guess? Yeah, bust yourself. Yeah, okay. yeah bust yourself. <laughs> Kyle, can I go on? Yeah, go on, go on. People are just yelling in their cars. This this. random wolf of the week was traded to the Timberwolves along with two first-round picks for big man Al Jefferson. Oh, Oh, Costa Kuvis. God dang it. (laughs) (laughs) Do you want to give him the buzzer, Phil? Well done. Brad Well done, dude. Nice job. (laughs) No, Phil. Hey, I want to, at this board acceptance, I want to first thank Phil because Phil saying Brad Miller really started – I started thinking about tall I think white dudes for the just, Kings. My pen just broke all over the table. <laughs> Damn, oh. that was like twelve clues, man. That was crazy. insult to injury. <sighs> I think we Costa got fourteen Kufos, in. Man, it's a great how many, one. How many games did Qualdrich play? Did he ever play, or did he just collect a bunch? Did of he checks? play for the no, Kings? No, he played. I think Qualdrich played for the Kings. He, I don't know if he let's played look up. For the I'm Kings, gonna look up Qualdrich real quick here. Uh, quick, uh, this is your random note. wolf of the week uh, uh, post game yeah, show here. He did Deep play dive. in 2012, 2013. He played 15 games for the Kings, which is not necessarily what Ross said most of his career. Uh, but he did look like he played 83 games for the Minnesota Timberwolves. But he was in that McDonald's All American game. If you go back and look, like what was it, 07, Ross? That okay. game had a yes. bunch yep. of dudes in it. Uh, I remember Johnny Flynn was in it as well. So. That was the toughest one, I think. I done. almost guessed Greg Odin, but then I was like, did he, wait, did he play for the Wolves for 30? I don't know. The Wolves had some dark, weird years there. But the, uh, For the while there, they were like the DMV. Like, everyone had to come through for a couple days and just, like, <laughs> get their paperwork, their business, move on. No one wanted to be here. <laughs> Good stuff, uh, Ross. So, congratulations to Kyle. Another another victory. In Write that Wolf down. Write that down. Phil will never get another random Wolf of the oh, Week. Oh, no. Prize. I got a hot streak in me. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, the Jamal, I'm the Jamal Crawford of random Wolf of the Week, man. I'll just I'll hit you with a random oh, hot streak Phil, at some Phil, point. Phil, before we sign off, because um, I've had people ask, like, we're going to be doing a lot of content, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have Flagrant Howls and Scorner. So, note. yes. Flagrant Howls. Now, you're going to be – you're going to be – people are going to see you all over the place. You're going to be doing <laughs> Dane Morris podcast. You're going to be doing multiple days a week with Flagrant Howls. Yep. Uh, I know that Judd is going to be a regular part of Flagger and Howl. So we're going to do a lot of post-game live recaps. We're also going to be doing, if for like the late, late games, mm-hmm. we'll be doing like morning recaps, but uh, near daily Flagger and Howl's episodes from now until whenever they are eliminated from the playoffs with all hands on deck. Cool. Yeah. And, and a, sh- a selfish, shameless plug again, but uh, I'm flying home. To, or to home. I feel like the Midwest is my home. Oh, I'm flying back tomorrow, but if you're free tomorrow night, Seven o'clock, uh, Dane, Britt, and I are doing a live show over at Falling Knife, and uh, we're going to kind of use it as a playoff kickoff party. So if you want to come hang out, we'll answer a bunch of questions. We have a hot mic for people. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited for that, and I'll be in Phoenix next week too, so I'll be doing as much content with Phil as I can. And just appreciate everyone that listened all season because this was a lot of fun for me, and I know it was for the guys on the team. Boys, I want to wish you both a very happy NBA playoff season and uh, publicly acknowledge how much you guys bust your butt to cover the Timberwolves and talk about them. So I hope you guys have a fun playoff run. All of us have a fun playoff run in us. So happy NBA playoff season uh, to all who celebrate. Thank you, producer Ross. And thank you to any Suns fans who are hate watching <laughs> this podcast here. We appreciate you as well. This is a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast.